ಪಿ ಎಸ್ ಮೂರ್ತಿ ಅಲಾಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಮೈ ಕೋ ಚೇರ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ನವೀನ್ ಪರಾಶರ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ವಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಕಾಂಪ್ಲಿಮೆಂಟ್ ದ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಔಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ಏಟ್ ಆಬ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬೀನ್ ಸೆಲೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಯುನೀಕ್ನೆಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ವಾಟ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಕವರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ರಿಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟಿಂಗ್ ದ ವೈಡ್ ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ರಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಎಂಟೈರ್ ಇಂಡಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸೊ ಕಂಗ್ರಾಚುಲೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ದ ಗೈಡ್ಲೈನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಫೋರ್ಟೀನ್ ಮಿನಿಟ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಈಚ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಟು ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿದಿನ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೇ ಬಿ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಯು ಟಚ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ವ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಾಫ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ ಆರ್ ತರ್ಟೀನ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಲೋಸಿಂಗ್ ಅದರ್ವೈಸ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಗೋ ರೈಟ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಲಂಚ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಸೊ ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ಸ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಆನ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ತರುಣ್ ಕುಮಾರ್ ಮಿಶ್ರಾ ಫೌಂಡರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಚೀಫ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಟಜಿ ಆಫೀಸರ್ ಡಿಟೆಕ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜೀಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಬ್ಯಾಲೆನ್ಸಿಂಗ್ ಟೆಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟಚ್ ದಿ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಫಾರ್ಮೇಟಿವ್ ಇವಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಇವಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಚ್ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಇನ್ ದ ಡಿಜಿಟಲ್ ಏಜ್ ಗೋ ಎ ಹೆಡ್ so uh, very good morning to everyone i am tarun mishra i am the founder director of detect technologies a global company which is serving major oil and gas industries and other industries across the world through its ai enabled platforms uh, that largely deal with uh, automating the entire of hsse aspects of uh, various different sectors of industries so today i am going to talk and deep dive into this aspect of uh, aspect of how safety uh, has evolved in the ecosystem and how technology has integrated very deeply today to solve some of the major problems in this sector before we even start let's start with asking this question with all the investments that has gone today into safety we say more or less we have reached the gold standard then the question is is there anything left to be fixed or everything is already fixed the statistics let me tell you says otherwise today international labor organization is saying world over annually nearly 1.25 trillion dollars is being lost which is resulting from worker safety related issues and process safety related asset downtimes a staggering close to about 6000 fatalities and serious injuries are being reported daily which means as we were speaking and talking here yesterday 6000 people had permanent disabilities or were meeting fatalities and 89% of serious incidents are being reported with more than 40 hours of delay where you cannot do anything about it at that point so this begs the question that with the evolving work environment that we are uh, making with the challenge in dem- energy demand that we are having with the construction as it is emerging how do we focus on making it safe how do we make it uh, uh, our priority our core value and not just something that we do it for the sake of it what is the result what is the cause of all of these uh, big numbers that i just spoke right and for that i would refer you to one of the research that was done by uk government's sh hse institute where they have found that most of the times 80% when the incident is being reported we go into a reactionary approach we don't go into a strategic correction approach and there is a reason for that the reason is we do not have enough data to go into a strategic corrective measure or a strategic strategic corrective approach here if when deep dive was done by the same institute we found that almost 70% of the cases where reactionary approaches were taken actually it was supposed to be a strategic correction and not a reactionary uh re- reactionary approach to that situation and most of these strategic changes are uh, summarized into these 10 broad pillars which is uh, organizational change uh, your uh, appropriate staffing appropriate training appropriate uh, compliance with different safety procedures on ground education of people the safety culture that is present on the site the ergonomics the errors in maintenance and so on so forth so the guidelines that we have today already with us we can see some of these guidelines like heinrich uh, Pil- heinrich uh, pyramid we have we have konoko phillips model and so on so forth all of them speak about the same thing which is if we have to make a safety gold standard a safety benchmark we need to not just see 
the major incidents and major injuries rather we have to start with all the risk that is coming in conoco philips it says that if you are able to handle 300000 safety observations that are coming on a day to day basis and lay emphasis on that it will lead to maximum one fatality at the end of the day which means by capturing those observations by acting on them proactively you are ensuring there is near zero fatality which we call it as goal zero for all of our industries but this is not happening this is basically not possible and the reason is in the plan do check and act cycle majority of the time today where the safety officers are spending is on checking auditing going on the site spending time in capturing the observations and capturing the violations they do not have the time to actually act on these observations and if we do not create that bandwidth for our safety officers to act on the observation which is truly their job then never will this improve improvement come in this industry of ours so let's take a practical example for this how does it happen we when we take a confined space we know that in confined space we have to take a permit we have to uh, do the check for the gas sensors we have to make sure the temperature is correct people are educated trained to enter into a confined space and they go and they do the job well if this was to happen never would a confined space injury actually will happen as per osha guidelines as per iogp guideline canadian guidelines if we follow it an accident is never going to happen but it doesn't work like that there are heat stress issues because of which a person collapses inside there are leakages sometimes the decontamination doesn't happen well and there is no way of putting qualified safety officers at all places at all times to check all of this and make sure everything is happening as per international guidelines and that 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 is where there is a big deviation from what is supposed to be done or what is expected and what is actually being done and this is where we need to integrate technology into our mainstream how we can integrate technology let's take some of the points first is data collection today data collection as i spoke is largely manual we can automate data collection let the data be collected by machines we can use our existing infrastructure such as your cameras your iot sensors your devices which are capturing data on the ground integrate those data with a state of art artificial intelligence which is trained on all the osha guidelines which is trained on all the different standards across the world so make an eye have a brain so that way we can have your cameras become qualified safety officers who are also acquiring the data who are also processing the data we can make training which is largely manual right now in toolbox forms and checklists and excels we can make the training centralized over a digital platform communication which is largely verbal can be centralized and disseminated at the same time campaigns can be run we can have digital way of tracking whether the communication has passed on in the correct manner or not and what is the effectiveness of it documentation and reporting another big aspect of where manual documentation is now becoming very very tedious and digital tools are becoming more and more reliable incident investigation where we are doing as per the old methodology our yy analysis our fishbone analysis and so on so forth we need to seriously modernize the rcs where rcs can be done faster and the recommendations have a clear way of it being implemented and there is a clear evidence that this incident investigation has been implemented and this will never happen again and there is no repeat of such incidents ever in the future we have the method of feedback collection which can now be used as ai we can tell where exactly what is happening and whether the same thing is being repeated or not being repeated similar thing goes on for risk assessment the response time and the standardization of the entire safety web technology today can play a very big role in changing the landscape and that's how the shells and exons and philips and motivas and in india we have worked with the largest of the largest bbcls and iocls of the world which have uh, which have resulted into a change i will take some examples of the world over experience that we have had some three examples i'll take first is your construction project where we have seen that an alert this is a health related thing where we have seen an alert was raised about 12 individuals working at height that there is some elevated parameters medical parameters your heart rate your your basically your uh, blood pressure and so on so forth there are elevated parameters and these people are on site it was found out that one person among those 12 was at a serious risk if not addressed that day that person would have collapsed second incidents is that of a maintenance operation where there was a scaffolding that was being erected at the same place 
this scaffolding in the past had led to a LTI. In that place, when an alert was raised to an operator, the operator went and did a toolbox talk. All the non-compliances and deviations were corrected and made sure that in such a place, the same incidents are not repeating. In the third case, that is of a uh, commissioning activity, a load testing was, for example, scheduled. An inappropriate way of using chain block pulley was adopted. Load was swinging. People were at risk. Load was about to fall. An alert was raised and proactively this was addressed so that no injuries and fatalities can happen. These are examples of how being proactive and making sure that all of the lowest of the lowest incidents can be addressed to avoid the fatalities and serious injuries. And this leads to a very big cultural transformation. When we, when we start seeing that uh, there is decrease in the overall observations reported per day, there is a clear decrease in the overall uh, high risk observations that are being reported per day and there is a learner's mindset being developed at the site. People feel, yes, this is not a blame for me, rather I can learn and I can improve. This cultural transformation is extremely important for our people at the site to then start feeling safe, which is psychological safety. When we start feeling that, yes, by working here, I am safe, nothing is going to happen to me because everything, if there is any alert, if there is anything that is in advance, an industry is there, a person is there who will come and protect me at that point. And there is obviously the enhancement of human performance that results from there not taking shortcuts, making sure we are always on the safe path at the same time, making sure that deadlines are being completed. This coaching, this ability of transforming the culture and the behavioral aspect is truly the goal of DETECT. Wherever we work, this is what we target. Let's take another case study that is of a turnaround. In turnarounds, different types of modalities such as cameras, drones, etc. are being used today where we can capture the data. When integrated with the AI, what we have seen at the start of the turnaround, there are very high number of observations and violations that are being reported. Per day, nearly about 100, 150 observations and violations are being reported. But what we have also noticed during the peak of the turnaround, these observations come down by 70 to 80 percent. This has never been seen before. But since we have arrested that at the start itself, we have posted it correctly, we never see any turnaround actually resulting into a single serious injury or fatality because of these proactive measures. Everybody is checking each other, everybody is correcting each other. People know that we are in surveillance, we are in protection of many such qualified safety officers in the form of cameras and so on and so forth, ensuring that there is no safety observation 24-7 across the days. So, so now the world is changing. With the integration of technology, what we are seeing is where we have put people on the problem, where we have practiced leadership on the problem, the Bradley curve, as we say it for HSSE, is now transforming with the worker engagement at the front line. They are becoming the front line leaders. They are becoming the practitioners of safety, the champions of safety. And they are being empowered by technology in their hand. So if we do that empowerment, I can assure what we have seen is a major transformation in the overall safety culture and the industry reaching the gold standards of safety that today is being uh, practiced across globally. So I will leave you with this thought. Today, what we need to do at industries is we need to prepare for success. We need to proactively identify uh, the line of fire risks. We need to proactively act on these line of fire risks. We need to engage with the team and spread awareness in the most effective manner possible. We should always be ready to respond, which means we should always be informed on deviations. We should have the sufficient data points on where these deviations are happening, send assistance to the frontline workers when they require it the most, and make sure that the issues specific planning is being done. Work related or job specific trainings are being provided actively and uh, in adequate manner. And then lastly, we should take undertake long-term planning and long-term strategic changes. With all the data points in place, we can now decide how our long-term strategy should look like. Which are the areas which we need to focus on the hardest? Where are There are situations where we have seen industries which have had 70% observations coming from vehicle-related issues. And they have run specific campaigns. And trust me, those observations have come down to be zero. 
these things don't happen in a day but we can prepare for a long term strategy make sure that we have sufficient data points on where we need to act on and then make a serious change in the entire ecosystem through the intervention of technology and human commitment and human passion that is all thank you ladies and gentlemen for your kind attention thanks thanks tarun for a wonderful presentation and it's uh, you made certain important points like the change in mindset and the part of act for safety champions these are some important aspects and of course the digital interventions you have mentioned for the long term planning for enhancing the safety in the industry uh, now i call upon mr piyush a process safety engineer from backtel for his presentation yeah, before piyush starts uh, i just want to acknowledge the presence of uh, edosd the highest authority on safety in oil industry sri arun mittal sahab is here and he has graced this uh, uh, forum welcome him sir. welcome so please start piyush all right thank you sir good morning everyone my name is piyush singh i am a process safety engineer at bechtel india so the topic i am going to be talking about is risk based fireproofing so starting off the topic let me take a minute to introduce bechtel uh, since the year 1898 we have completed over 25000 projects across the globe and in the last 125 years we have become a preferred epc partner for many companies and we have in our portfolio we cover the entire life cycle life cycle of a project starting from uh, conceptual design all the way to detail engineering and construction and this is for the entire gamut of industries uh, energy ma infrastructure manufacturing nuclear everything anything that you imagine we can build so starting off my topic what is fireproofing fireproofing is a kind of insulation which provides passive fire protection against uh, the element you are trying to protect note that note the word passive it is a form of a mitigative safeguard it does not prevent the event from occurring it only mitigates the impact from that event so currently in the industry the focus is on uh, passive fire protection against pool fires which is captured in the relevant codes and standards like api 2218 as well as osd 164 so these codes are uh, prescriptive uh, codes which slightly touch upon the topic of jet fire fire proofing however the end application is left to the user so any uh, meeting starts with a safety moment so i have chosen this particular incident from a us refinery so you can clearly see uh, so just to introduce this event there is a 90 feet pipe rack which is uh, supported by two major columns adjacent to each other and if you see the top left of your screen you can no you notice that the column is not fireproof which has buckled in the event of a adjacent fire which has then led to the entire pipe rack collapsing on the other hand on the right hand side you will notice there are two columns which were fireproofed even though there is some charring and discoloration the structure has not lost its integrity so diving into it there is a gap in the industry the current prescriptive methods falls short of the risk based analysis approaches that have uh, taken place in the industry any kind of safety system is now backed by a risk based analysis approach be it uh, fire and gas system design or anything else however these uh, approaches currently do not fall into place for passive fire proofing and the jet fire mitigation currently relies on design approaches such as depressurization isolation reorientation of flanges and the provision of flange guards so to bridge this gap the proposal we have is uh, is condensed into this simple flow chart on your screen what we've tried to do is we've tried to keep the methodology as close to a qra study as possible in order to minimize the amount of additional effort required in a live project In this particular slide, I'll be talking about the first three steps, which are um, as follows. The first two steps are very similar to a QRI study. 
and uh, the first step is to define the isolatable sections in your facility, uh, define the hole sizes. For those particular hole sizes, in the second step, you'll be calculating the leak frequencies. And in the third step, you'll be performing the consequence modeling for those events that you've defined. The difference here is the calculation of the fire resistance time, which I will touch upon in the next slide. So what is fire resistance time? It's the ability of an element to withstand a standard uh, thermal impact. The uh, testing of a particular element to withstand a thermal impact is particularly done through a, a series of tests, which are driven by some codes such as ASTM E119, UL1709. What they do is they put the element in a furnace, a very high heat flux furnace, and they test the material against a standard time temperature curve. If the material fails before the time temperature curve ends, you can figure out that the material is not capable to withstand a fire based on the standardized test. In our desktop study, we focused on standard steel sections which were used in a facility. And the methods for calculating these uh, fire resistance time in a facility are uh, typically twofold. The first method is to use the SFP handbook method. And the second method is to use the US NRC method. The SFP handbook method is more of a theoretical approach where they developed a curve fitting methodology and they try to reiterate what has been done in ASTM E119. And uh, the US NRC method on the other hand is more of a basic principles heat transfer approach. In our study, we figured out that both of these methods are quite uh, similar in the end outcome. Name, meaning that the end uh, fire resistance time that you calculate for a steel section is quite similar. And the point of including the fire resistance time in this calculation is so that you can filter out certain events, which I will uh, further discuss in the study. So moving on in the methodology, in this slide, we'll be focusing on these two steps. Once you've calculated the the leak frequencies in the previous step in the in the um, top part of the slide you'll notice the inventory approach is then used to calculate the leak, the jet fire and pool fire frequencies which is again a very standard part of any qra in the second part once you have calculated the uh, consequence modeling uh, step in the previous slide you will then use those uh, consequence modeling results and the fire resistance time results and you will calculate and you will try to figure out what is the severity of the impact. In this case, the impact will be focused on the asset damage because fireproofing at the end of the day is uh, mainly for preventing asset damage. So as you can imagine, we have mostly, we have covered all the input that we need to perform a risk uh, calculation. We have the frequencies, we have the severity. Using both of these inputs, we can use the risk matrix approach to figure out where are we lying on the risk matrix. Is the final risk against the event acceptable or not? If it is not acceptable, you will definitely provide fireproofing. However, if it is acceptable, you don't need fireproofing. So, this is the methodology that I talked about. However, in our study, we implemented this on a large scale energy project. The project itself had about 700 elements or 700 events in the QRA study. Using this approach, we were able to filter out more than 695 events and we were only left with five events at the end. The main uh, filtering out was done using the uh, dimensional accidental event criteria, which is defined in NORSOC Z013, which basically says that any event which has a frequency which is greater than 1 e to the power minus 4 becomes your basis for layout. So this was used to filter out many of the events in the QRA. And the second part is the fire resistance time, which for this particular facility we calculated was in the range of 8 to 26 minutes. Using the minimum time, uh, which is eight minutes, we were again able to filter out many of the events from a QRA study. 
so as i mentioned eventually we ended up with only five events which were then further taken for a, a consideration for fireproofing once you have the events identified we plotted them on the plot plan at the 37.5 kilowatt per meter square uh, thermal thermal radiation and this became the limit for fireproofing for the facility so this is the overall methodology however there are still some gaps and challenges ahead the first thing is our study focused mostly on steel sections however uh, anybody in the industry will know that there are multiple other elements which are fireproofed such as cables equipment supports etc those fire resistance times need to be standardized and evaluated and in a mature industry like oil and gas or energy any change in the defined work processes is met with a lot of inertia and unfortunately it takes a significant event to uh, make any drastic changes so on top of that you will you might also face any some regulatory issues and insurance issues because again this would be a first of a kind or a novel approach and at the end if you are working with any large scale onshore facility which is spread out over a large area any impact on the fireproofing wall zones would definitely impact the cost of the project so that's all i had to say about this topic i would like to take this uh, podium to thank my team babna birader and uh, animesh agrawal and uh, thank you I, if you have any questions i would be happy to answer them thank you fireproofing and fireproofing is one of the important design considerations and it is always always been uh, complaint of clients you made this structure so huge so we have to explain that this is not a huge structure it is basically a fireproofing to protect the uh, pipe racks and all other structures so thank you for enlightening and definitely this uh, considerations will help in optimizing the requirement of fire proofing also so i now call upon mr shivanand parihar joint director who has the for his presentation namaskar uh, respected session chairs other co speakers and uh, delegates i am shivind singh i am joint director in osd oil industry safety directorate and i have moved there from engineers india limited on deportation in next few minutes uh, i will talk about a few case studies in indian oil and gas industry and then few statistics about uh, incident in oil and gas industry and then uh, ro road map based on our audits our observations uh, to make our uh, installation a safer workplace uh, first two slides are typical osd slides it is a technical directorate under ministry of uh, petroleum and natural gas uh, it was formed in 1986 after uh, an uh, incident in uh, lpg uh, terminal uh, it is a small group of technical people who come from the background of refinery petrochemical lng design enp and marketing operations we have signed mous with uh, world lpg association american petroleum institute uh, ccps and ul as far as activities of osd is concerned there are number of activities we perform the major is development of standards uh, currently we have around 120 standards uh, which covers entire hydrocarbon industry refineries uh, process plant petrochemical lng everything and all everything operation design maintenance uh, for safety uh, point of view then safety audits is uh, another major job in uh, previous year 22 23 we carried out safety audits of 25 process plant 134 locations around 136 uh, enp locations 11000 more than 11000 km of pipelines we are regulator in offshore incident investigation whatever major inc uh, incidents are reported to us we uh, do investigation and give recommendation Uh, other than that to enhance uh, awareness among the industry people we conduct uh, seminars uh, workshops and webinars like suraksha sambhag uh, with the motto of learning from others mistake let us quickly move to our first case study uh, this incident was happened in a gas processing plant uh, this plant was uh, 
receiving gas from various offshore field and from this plant uh, gas and condensate separates out and uh, sweet gas is sent to other downstream consumers so in uh, this incident happened in 2019 in uh, one uh, night shift uh, there was some leak was observed in gas receptor area gas terminal area and uh, leak uh, vapor cloud was uh, so dense that leak was, could be identified by cctv and uh, suddenly fire broke out means actually uh, uh, the cloud was dense uh, so people could not enter that area so exact location of uh, leak could not be identified and suddenly fire broke out <clears throat> actual uh, as per cctv if you see uh, uh, fire, the source of ignition was away from the uh, leakage area. Later it was identified that the nearby uh, electric lamp, it was suspected source of ignition. And uh, by, uh, after observations, after uh, incident investigation, it was found that uh, by design this lamp was flame proof. Because uh, as per the area classification, it was provided flame proof. But due to poor maintenance or poor uh, integrity, uh, its integrity was compromised and bolts were loosened and from there uh, the ignition uh, and caught fire. And uh, in that area there were number of lines, few line, incoming lines, outline, uh, outgoing lines and uh, few metering skits were also there. So there were number of flange joints. Uh, when the uh, incident investigation happened, we observed that main leakage was from a 6 inch uh, orifice meter in a condensate line. Uh, I am saying it main leakage because there are number of flanges uh, over there and due to poor shabby condition of maintenance, uh, uh, non-standard bolting and all, so fugitive emission chances cannot be ruled out. Uh, the flange under discussion, 6 days prior to this incident, uh, one leakage uh, was already happened there. So maintenance team replaced O-ring, but they did, uh, did not uh, do any root cause analysis. Ideally, this was a uh, loss of primary containment, uh, root cause analysis should have been done. Non-standard stud and bolts were used in almost all flange joints. Uh, in MOVs were provided in that area in all main lines, all lines co connected to skids and uh, inlet outlet lines, but all MOVs were on local mode. Uh, it, uh, it needs to be highlighted that during risk study, there was a discussion of uh, leak in the terminal area, but uh, that was complied, stating that MOVs are provided and that can be isolated area can be isolated from remote location. But at the time of emergency, those facility was not available because MOVs were uh, uh, on local mode. Other than that, the uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures, standing maintenance pro procedures were not available for the activities to be performed in the, that area. As far as root cause, these were our, our observation as far as root cause is concerned. So root cause is uh, non-compliance of deviation from uh, recommendation of risk studies and usage of non-standard, uh, non-OEM supplied uh, items. Then violation of safety management system, work permit was not there, SOPs were not there, SMPs were not there. And then, uh, unavailability or not doing RC of LOPC. These are the main causes of this incident. In our recommendation, we suggested that uh, in all the cases of LOPC, root cause analysis should be there, asset integrity to be uh, enhanced, periodical uh, function checking of all critical walls, MOVs, ROSOVs needs to be done, and then standard or OEM recommended space to be used. In next uh, case study, this incident was happened in a refinery. Uh, this is a heater after the blast, after the incident of a vacuum distillation unit. Uh, this unit was under shutdown for a month. And when a startup was taking place, a heater, uh, blast in heater took place. You can see by the uh, picture, the heater shell was opened from uh, radiant section and uh, its support legs were uprooted. It was a heavy blast. And, um, Due to explosion, the refractory bricks were scattered in the area of 30, 40 meter, around 19 people were injured. And however, there was no fatality, but uh, there was huge property loss as well as delay in startup for a month. 
our observation uh, the main observation was that violation of sop in the form of uh, uh, heater startup during startup uh, it is a recommended practice or and sop it mentioned in sop also that just before the startup you need to uh, 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 purge the box but it was not done box purging was done two hours prior to this light up activity so this is violation of sop again the second thing is uh, furnace startup light up was started with main burner not from pilot burner this is again a second uh, violation of SOP. And then fuel gas was continuously going in the furnace for 40 minutes as by DCS record. It means either some valves are passing or valves were kept open, means field, thorough field checking was not there. These were the three, uh, few missing things. Uh, in root cause, uh, fuel gas was uh, inside the furnace and uh, due, due to startup, LPG was used as a fuel gas and it settled down. So uh, this became more dangerous. Uh, checking was not done, violation of SOP, checklist uh, was available but its responsibility matrix and duties were not mentioned there. So th these were the root cause. In recommendation part we recommended that uh, SOPs with checklist and responsibility matrix should be there and strong strict implementation of that. Before uh, and after the furnace purging, critical fiscal checking you turn to ensure that burner block wall are fully closed and to build competency, training, refresher training to be provided the, to the all concerned employees related to the activities they are performing. <clears throat> Let us come to some uh, statistics about incident in Indian oil and gas industry. The presented data is based on uh, incident reported to OISD. Uh, this is uh, from last five years. You can see uh, though industry has become safer because uh, uh, fatalities and incident both are on uh, reducing trend. But uh, still, I feel a lot many things are required because in 2022-23, around 18-20 fatalities were there. So still, there is scope of uh, improvement. If we analyze the root cause in, of the incident in previous five years, we see a major chunk comes from disregard of OP, uh, SOP, around 40%. And then inadequate supervision, around 13%. So if we add uh, both of them, it comes around more than 50%. It means human related behavior plays a major role, very important role to make our workplace safe or unsafe. And if we add few more data like uh, compliance, non-compliance of PPE and uh, negligent driving. So this statement becomes stronger. If we further uh, do further data mining, what we can see, this data presented data is from uh, last 10 years. I have divided into two parts. 14 to 18, 19 to 23. All root cause causes are repeating in same percentage. Disregard of SOP in uh, 14 to 18, it was 40%. 19 to uh, 23, again it is uh, 20%. Similar situation with inadequate supervision. So question arises, are we learning from our mistakes or we are repeating same mistakes and mistakes again and again? Uh, I don't think we are learning enough. Because there is a classic example. These two cases are from two different uh, location, different time zone uh, in a petrochemical plant. Means plant are also different. But you see root cause in both the case. One was happened in 2010, another one in 23. Root ca cause is typically exactly same. Few more examples we can see. Uh, that uh, I'm not talking about process uh, related incident. These are simple incidents where no high temperature, high pressure, no hazardous chemical was involved, no reaction run away was involved, no metallurgy failure was involved. Simple understanding of safety behavior, behavioral issue could have averted this incident. In one of the case, inside the refinery, uh, steel bars are, were being unloaded from a truck. A person uh, was working in nearby area of a scaffolding job. He was not wearing helmet. Somehow that, is, uh, that uh, uh, bars hit him on his head and he died. In another example, folding material were movement, uh, movement was being done by hand cart in, inside the refinery premises. Uh, in Slopey Road, the, due to sp speed that uh, they could not manage the speed of that cart that toppled, one person came under it and he died. In last year, three people have died inside the refinery premises due to road accident. Fatalities have been reported from a refinery or complex premises due to unloading of pipe in a pipe yard. Three people fatality have been reported uh, in an excavation job only. 
so i want to communicate that these are not the cases where some very much technical thing is involved only behavioral things are involved so what is missing i think sense of risk is missing because same kind of mistakes again happening and happening again and again it is our duty if you are permit issuer if you are safety officer you need to check whether everything is in line whether uh, they are following safety behavior properly or not uh, now uh, i'll discuss about path forward uh, we have focused uh, main on human behavior in fact uh, working group formed of the tout incident by ministry they have given more emphasis on hu uh, human factor in human this human factor includes first is safety culture a uh, commitment of management for the safety and uh, employees perception about the safety then what is the role of safety department in uh, an organization and uh, to whom they are reporting what is the structure whether they are uh, adequately empowered or not all these come under this and kpis include safety indicating parameters or not these are part of safety culture then competency assurance of employees it comes through training refresher training retraining means training for everything every new job new responsibility new assignment should be after training safety training should be the essential criteria of operational training and uh, uh, there should be some certain criteria of any post and to make this training effective uh, latest technologies like ar augmented reality virtual reality 3d imaging or uh, simulation should be part of training program safety management of outsourced uh, outsourced job and contract workforce the first and most important thing is risk rating of contractor to be there down the line over the years you will have data uh, to finalize the contractor and then risk profiling of job uh, contract should mention about uh, safety things compliance of sop uh, inventory of sop awareness about sop and uh, site implementation of sop in job supervision work permit implementation site supervision rules and regulation awareness of rules and regulation and then uh, adequate tools and tackle and agencies effectiveness of, uh, sir, of uh, safety audit internal whether internal or external its responsibility of audit for horizontal compliance of all the uh, recommendations there should be a dedicated pool and effective pool of sa internal safety auditors and audit safety audit should be time bound frequency bound and compliance should also be time bound in safety compliance enhances these are the some steps where you should know the regulation now you uh, further you can plan then uh, training we have discussed about communication uh, latest equipment latest agencies pp compliance we can follow and we can enhance uh, the the safety compliance due to this last slide uh we can use technological and latest technology to enhance safety it is it can be used in uh, training it can be used data generation it can be used uh, uh, asset integrity uh, uh, like drones robotics for uh, asset integrity advanced monitoring system for uh, your rotary equipment and uh, it's a pm with with the help of these technology and simple human training human behavior uh, uh, things we can definitely improve safety at our workplace thank you thank you shivendra for this very insightful presentation uh, you had mentioned about uh, some case studies and uh, what we have uh, learned and uh, one of the uh, eye opening uh, slide of yours was uh, about uh, there's no change in the last 5 years uh, under each category and uh, under supervision uh, it is actually gone up this one thing that's a wake up call i think uh, you also talked about vulnerability sense of vulnerability and, and we have a next presentation by mr manoj singh uh, chief manager hpcl mumbai refinery on vulnerability index an innovative tool for loss prevention in refinery a case study mr manoj singh please thank you shivendra for uh, creating stage for my presentations actually my topic is on vulnerability index So before uh, just I will introduce our my company. See, HPCL has two refineries, Mumbai refinery and Vaidya refineries. Apart from that, 
एक्चुअली इज इन डिटेल्स हाँ हेलो हाँ ये अपार्ट फ्रॉम डेट एक्सपीशियल इज इन डिटेल्स ऑल्सो एंड नाउ ऑल्सो एंटर इन ई वी डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन अपार्ट फ्रॉम टू रिफेंड इज एक्सपीशियल हैज वन आर एन डी सेंटर्स एट बेंगलोर इनफैक्ट रिसेंटली वी हैव गॉट टू हंड्रेड पैटर्न एंड अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस टू रिफेंड इज वी हैव जेवीज इन राजस्थान एच एम एल एंड एम आर पी एल नाउ आई टॉक अबाउट मुंबई रिफेंडरी तो स्पेशल मुंबई रिफाइनरी हैज टेकन अ लॉट ऑफ सेफ्टी इनिशिएटिव वन इज थर्ड पार्टी लाइब्रेटी एस यू नो दैट एनी वर्कर्स और कॉन्ट्रेक्टर हु इज कमिंग टू अवर रिफाइनरी देर आर लाइब्रेटीज ऑफ सेफ्टी इज ऑन अस सो बिकॉज वी हैव टू टाइप ऑफ पीपल कमिंग वन फॉर प्लांट एरिया वन इज फॉर नॉन प्लांट एरियाज सो वी सेग्रेटेड पास फॉर दैम एंड फॉर प्लांट एरियाज पीपल वी यूज टू गिव दैम वन लिंक विच कंटेन सेफ्टी क्लिप and along with that after that one quiz will be there so once they completed this quiz only they will enter this plant area so this way we ensure that they are undergone safety training similarly we have loan worker protections the supervisors who are working in field we have provided them this uh, black line safety your gas detectors so this uh, gas detector has gps feature so th- whereby we can know where they are in located in the fields then contractor safety as a part of contractor safety we created uh, one spot the hazard activity for them here the contractors are encouraged to identify hazards the contractors are the people who are everywhere in field because uh, they have eyes in the field actually you can say so we created con spot the hazards where contractors are encouraged to identify hazards and uh, report to supervisors and this is, and, and the best one of them given prize so this is contractors are uh, encouraged for identifying hazards and there were we have a lot of ice in the field so this is one good initiatives we have taken apart from that we have weekly safety interactions with workers we have people from uh, our management used to interact with safety workers and ask them about the initiatives we can take as well as what are their this think they think about our safety initiatives then we have effective man- man- emergency managements like for level 1 and 2 incidents uh, we have automatic systems whereby alarms will come or message will come to coordinators so they can quickly know about the incident and started working on that then this these are some of the back practice we are following like pause what can go wrong pcms then uh, for road safety we have put this uh, speed indicators similarly we have use ai we have, as a part of uh, proof of concept we have implemented ai system to find whether the workers is wearing ppes or not so this is just like your cctv cameras now just now we because traffic police traffic police for controlling safety on road a lot of traffic police are required so what government is doing government is putting cctvs so this will ensure that all people are following rules similarly to ensure that people are following safety cultures that is wearing ppes in field we are using this ai cameras then these are also one concept called uat in this concept we are inc- we are incurring operation maintenance then uh, planning all people as a team who are working in the field we our hr team used to visit them to plan uh, to some outdoor activities they are made to do outdoor activities so as a team will be built and then there will be personal bonding for creating personal bonding in, among them this uat concept has been evolved then similarly for uh, tank inspections we are using uh, your robotic so this way we can uh, minimize uh, risk and plus uh, this is very fast so minimize time also save time so as you see that uh, a safety business your uh, company reputation is depend on safety performance so for for uh, ensuring that we are following safety insurance we are following our procedures then training everything we imparted and yet we are vulnerable to incidents <clears throat> as uh, just before slides we have been told 80% of incidents are because of unsafe acts and unsafe act is because of human behavior so there are lot of contributing factors for human behaviors 
which can cause these incidents. So among this, uh, this poor hazard admissions, inadequate provisions, and intentional violation by individual, these three factors, which are main major factors in online or plant job, which used to be daily, so this we try to take up in vulnerability index. Like these are the challenges, like uh, because uh, the plant people actually, because of routing uh, daily jobs, they become overconfident. So they thought that nothing can go wrong. So that's overconfidence. Then this identification, sir, because they does not identify risk, uh, because the daily day used to do job, so it become habitual. So that risk identification become uh, less in them. Plus uh, your uh, risk quantification, sir, and plus personal biasness. Some person will be more uh, risk capability people person or you can say or confidence the other is not there so there's also always, always personal business is there so these are the challenges for and for this we have remedies like this process called vi we have made so vulnerability index actually it is a dynamic tool actually means uh, based on the job it will calculate the vulnerability index of that job like see this example here, if we see that the same job, cutting, welding, grinding is there, but in, this is happening in two different parts. One is your outside plant, your uh, fabrication yard, and one is in plant area. So if you ask uh, from one to 10 scale, which is uh, where your risk is more. So naturally you can say that second job, plant area. Also the job is, job is similar, but the job location is a factor which determine job hazards. Similarly, apart from job location, if you see, now, the same job is there, but what happened is one is what morning and this is evening. So time is also one factor which increases job risk. So these are factors which affect job vulnerabilities. So if you see that one uh, in GCU plant, some job is there, cutting, welding, grinding. And this is done by trained and supervised people. And in one to scale, that job risk come to around seven, you can say. And if same job of cutting, welding, grinding, fabrication yard, if done by trained supervisor, it is coming below between 0 to 5 scale. That is very low. So this is the factor. We can say vulnerability index. So vulnerability index depends on mainly three factors. One is nature of job, type of hot works, cold works that we are doing, then location of jobs, plant where plant area, plus equipments, pipelines involved, and plus person involved. The more experience the person is there, more you can say the risk, less chances of risk is there. So in we see normal permit system, normal system, the work permit is there and monitoring by supervision is there. But what we have done in this job VIE, we have incorporated one third part is your supervision from external part. That is the main thing we have incorporated in this VIE. So as I told, the vulnerability index consists of three parts. One is location of job, second is nature of job, and third is human factors. So now what is your location of jobs? That is called area vectors. We are calling area vectors. So as I told in previous examples, like one is fabrication yard, one is unit. So hard location means job hazard is more in unit. Similarly, job hazards, we can say, is more when you say services, line services. One line carrying your class A product. One line carrying class B product. So naturally job hazard will be in class A product line. Similarly, auto ignitions like that. So we have identified what are some areas in plant where job can be more, like equipment lines areas, conditions, at surrounding atmosphere conditions also. If you see that pipe break, in pipe break, there are a lot of lines from different units are coming. So job at pipe break means battery limits and pipe breaks is more complex than job in units. So like that, we identify this area where job hazard will be more. And between zero, 1 to 10 scale, we have given that scale. Similarly, your job nature of job, that is called job vectors. Cutting, welding, grinding, we have identified each job we have given 1 to 10 scale, like cutting, welding, grinding, which is critical. You have created this more scale we have given. Similarly, confined space. Confined space also painting is more. Just supervision is less hazard than painting. So like that, we have identified confined space job hazards. Similarly, insulation removal. We can say insula insulation removal is a very simple job. In fact, a lot of accidents happen because of insulation removal. When there is your loss of containment is there, then insulation job is a very critical job. So that's why this why we have identified jobs and uh, given one to stage scale.
then third party is human vectors. Finally, as, I, as uh, our previous colleague told, that human bias, human are the main factors. Especially when they are working single, then chances of error is more. But when they are working as a team, there is less chances of your incident. Like what they identified 80 versus 20. So this, what we have done is this, uh, your vulnerability index, based on your job vulnerability, if job vulnerability is more than eight, then our senior management, generally GM or CGM, he will visit plant and see job locations, and then he will advise. So this way, what happened because operations people's job is to ensure that plant is running. So they take because this created biases in them, and they take risk. Means what we can say, if there is some risk is there, they used to take risk. But when the senior management come and he see that job from a new perspective. So he can take decision. He can say, no, this is very critical job, plus very risk is there. So we can avoid doing this job. Or we can take shutdown uh, and then do, not uh, in running plant. So this type of uh, business decision cannot be taken by supervisor, but can be taken by senior management. So this is a main important thing we have incorporated in this VI. This is a normal flow pattern in this. First uh, maintenance people used to create enter VI for a given job. Then this VI is validated by operation people. Because actually operations people knows a lot about these jobs plus conditions of plant. So that this has been validated by operations. After validations, the VI number for a job is come. If it is between uh, less than six, then section head used to visit. If it is six to eight, then division head. And if it is more than head, then head HOD, head department head, GMC, GM people. And it's main, as I told, one male will become based on VI of the job, male will come to these people. So we have as a trial project, we have implemented in our one plant, FCCU plant, this VI. So these are the, some screenshots of that unit. These are human factors. We Some ask questions we used to ask in human vectors, like experience of uh, person supervisors, experience of technicians, like that. And based on that, human vectors is calculated. And finally, VI will come. And this VI, you can, this is the dashboard of VI. So one main benefits of this VI is it is a good monitoring tool. We can, we can identify the job happening in the field and we can see which are the critical job happening in the field based on VI. And uh, in fact, uh, this, our safety people, we are being told that what, which are the critical jobs daily we have to visit plant and uh, see that how that is happening. Then second is planning utility. Once VI create created for a job, all job, then uh, planning people can see that today in this area, there are five, six critical jobs is happening. So they can tell if since five, six jobs are happening, it is very risky is there. So better we can avoid two, three jobs tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So this way they can plan jobs. Plus risk tool, advisory tools also. So now journey so far, as I told that just now we have implemented in our one plant, new FCCU as a tile basis and we are finding it very successful. So now our job is, now our main objective is to implement in throughout refineries. And that we are doing through permit system. So we, because now just now we have done SAP rollout. Just within, uh, just on uh, September only 2023, we have implemented SAP system. So now our objective is to this incorporation this VI in this permit system. So once this will be incorporated in permit system, for daily each job, we can get in permit system only we can get VI and we can easily monitor. So this is our objectives. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Manoj, for uh, getting into an interesting uh, topic, vulnerability index, where uh, three factors, the nature of job, the location, and the people uh, who are doing it, all three are considered and they're ranked and based on the uh, criticality, the um, supervision level goes up. Well, every job, there, there's a chance of the incidents happening. I think this uh, very uh, most important for uh, eliminating process-related events where, uh, uh, you know, there, there can be catastrophic uh, uh, consequences that uh, the, it, it eliminates the possibility of such uh, uh, incidents by increased level of supervision. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Uh, in fact, uh, in last, uh, I think, eight or nine years, working with HPCL in different refineries, and I have seen the consciousness of uh, HPCL refinery persons, especially uh, 
टू जॉब्स मुंबई रिफाइनरी एक्सपेंशन प्रोजेक्ट एंड वाइजैक रिफाइनरी दोज टू प्रोजेक्ट्स आर वेरी क्रूशियल विद रेस्पेक्ट टू सेफ्टी कंसिड्रेशन बिकॉज दे आर दी ब्राउन फील्ड एक्सपेंशन एंड इट इज़ नियर बाय जस्ट दी ऑपरेटिंग रिफाइनरी तो वी एज अ पार्ट ऑफ प्लानिंग ऑफ प्रोजेक्ट वी हैव सेग्रीगेटेड दी एंटायर एरियाज इन द रिफाइनरी ऑपरेशन एरिया एंड प्रोजेक्ट एरिया नो मूवमेंट जोन सो दिस कंसिड्रेशन आर वेल टेकन एंड वनरेबिलिटी इंडेक्स आई थिंक यू आर बींग फॉलोइंग फॉर सम टाइम नाउ फॉर इश्योरेंस ऑफ द परमिट्स एंड इट्स अ गुड दैट देर इज सम एनालिटिकल एस्पेक्ट इज देयर विथ रेस्पेक्ट टू आइडेंटिफिकेशन ऑफ द परमिट रिक्वायरमेंट्स सो थैंक यू फॉर wonderful presentation sir i now request uh, biswajit das dgm electrical oil india limited to talk on implementation of lightning protection measures on operational and existing petroleum storage tanks respected chairman co chairman and distinguished speakers delegates ladies and gentlemen uh, very good afternoon to you all i am profoundly thankful Uh, to all of you present here for showing interest in this session uh, and particularly to my topic implementation of lightning protection measures on operational petroleum storage tanks so let us see what is lightning so lightning is a natural phenomenon in which electrostatic discharges take place between uh, to charged region both this region may be in atmosphere or one in the atmosphere other on ground so this is the very basic definition i think all of you know about it now let us look at some statistics uh this uh, research paper published in the year 2005 in the journal of loss prevention in the process industries it shows they have analyzed 242 uh, accidents related to tank fire and there they found 80 accidents are because of lightning and another re recent study available on oilpro.ca website they are also telling 34% is because of lightning so almost one third accident is happening because of lightning uh, and those can be protected with effective lightning protection system in place it's a topic related to electrical domain so i will keep it as simple as possible because many things electrical is a difficult subject uh, actually there are two main reasons which causes the damage first one is static electricity so static electricity uh, causes potential difference and spark here it may be tank shell and the roof if they are not properly connected uh, through electrical conductive things and second one which causes damage is the lightning discharge current following lightning strike uh, so these are the two standards which talks about uh, lightning protection one is is oblique ic 62305 this is very popular standard as far as lightning is concerned and next is very specific and very good guideline by ysd uh it is ysd zdn 180 now let us see what ysd guideline says about uh, uh static electricity protection to the tanks so the tank floating roof uh shall be bonded to the tank shell by a uh, direct electrical conductor called a uh, bypass conductor and standard says in every 30 meter around the tank periphery there must be one bypass conductor and minimum if tank periphery is a small there should be minimum two so uh right side picture you can see this is a picture taken from our plant we have recently implemented it so it is a moving arm method uh there is another method uh, 
there is a real type of bypass conductor where uh, this bypass conductor bypass conductor gets spoiled in the reel. Uh, but many says that technology has got some disadvantages, basically because of uh, moving part is more. And in this uh, moving arm system, uh, moving part is less. So we have implemented it in our tank. And now coming to lightning discharge current. So uh, again, YSD guideline says, if roof and shell of a tank if thickness is more than 4.8, it is self-protected. No additional protection is required. In case roof thickness has gone below 4.8, in that case, additional protection is required. So standard says we can use lightning air terminals. And we can uh, uh, number two, we can use lightning protection mast around the storage tank. And third one is overhead shielding wire. So what are the options available when tank is already in place? Uh, we are not going to construct new tank, but it's an operational tank. So first option is to maintain the thickness above 4.8. Uh, now, of course, in operational tank, it is difficult. By any chance, say tank is going for maintenance and inspection, if possible, we can replace the roof with appropriate size of tanks. And during construction of new tank, I will suggest we can keep sufficient uh, uh, sufficient margin that, say, in the lifetime of the tank, its roof will not go down uh, below 4.8. So option two is uh, installation of air terminal on the shell of the on the shell of the tank. So roof thickness has gone below 4.8. We can install air terminals on the shell uh, ar around the periphery. Again, the challenge is to install that air terminals. We have to do some hot job. Uh, so that is challenging. And standard says a air terminal of six meter tall protects a portion of the tank up to 15 meter. So in that way, if my tank diameter is up to 30 meter, we can protect the complete tank with air terminal method. So third option is installation of air terminal on mast or poles supported from the... So here challenge is that since tank is operational to erect those supporting mast or pole uh, without hot job, hot job, that is challenging. So this is the fourth option. Uh, actually, this concept is taken from uh, IEC 62305, I have already said. Uh, this concept is called rolling spear method. So I am rolling a spear of imaginary diameter of 30 meter around the tank. And because of those phone numbers of shielding wires, uh, those that imaginary spear cannot catch the tank. So this is an isolated protection method. So tank is protected here. So here main challenge is that in uh, oil and gas industry, uh, tank of diameter say 50 meter and above is so common. So when tank dia is high, then we have to put those shielding wire. The main challenge is this to put that shielding wire or catenary wire, uh, large uh, towers has to be erected, which is again difficult for erection of the tower, say excavation of say up to three meter, that to inside the dike may be possible. Again, scenario may be a little bit different from case to case. Uh, again, another challenge is that that catenary wire has to be replaced periodically, say up to five to eight years. And if in case that catenary wire snaps, this protection will not be there. That is a challenge. So last option is, it is also isolated protection. We can erect some uh, towers around the tank and we will put air terminals on the towers. Uh, in that way also, completely using the towers only, we can protect tanks up to say diameter 30 meter. In case tank die is more than 30, we have to go for mixed method. So, uh, one catenary wire and around the tank, some air terminals mounted on the mast is possible. So in Oil India Limited, 
uh, for our eight numbers of crude oil storage tanks, those are fixed, fixed roof tanks. We have adopted this method and model given below, you can see when I roll a spear of 30 meter dia, uh, it is not touching the tank. So in that way it is protected. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. For, uh, this is one of the major concerns uh, because many of the uh, earlier installations are not having uh, especially the lightning protection in the tanks. Now it is being implemented across uh, all the refineries. And, uh, yes, thank sir. you for enlightenment of this. Uh, actually, we also face the same issue. Our tank uh, actually, after almost 15 years of operation, the roof thickness came down below 4.8. So our friend from OSG is there, they have pointed out that something to be done. So. We have analyzed all these methods, and after that, this last one, uh, we have implemented, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Vishwajit. Uh, there's one topic I think I have to mention. OSD has taken up the uh, last few years, and the entire industry had uh, paid attention to life on, life on lightning protection, and most structures, have, structures including storage tanks, they have been extensively covered. It's a topic poorly understood by the operating people and very thank you for bringing this, this further. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. So, we have the next speaker, uh, Gaurav Kumar from Kane Oil and Gas Vedanta. Exemplary HSE practices in a a ABH Unconventional Tight Oil Development, a comprehensive study. So, respected chair and speakers and the delegates namaskar to everyone so i'm gaurav i'll be presenting on behalf of ravi chandak and kumar manish who are the authors of these uh, this paper and the topic is as sir said exemplary hsc practices in unconventional abh field development and hopefully i would have uh, justified this topic by the end obviously that depends on the session chair moving on with the thought for the moment that has the ability to change a lot, we get the level of safety that we demonstrate we want. We as in the decision makers and the leaders of the industry here, that this is to call a call for us so we can make the change happen. Moving on, the content that I'll be going through, obviously because safety comes first, I'll be talking to the basics of safety that we are practicing day in and day out. And then how one model that I'll be uh, talking about, the multi-well and single pad mo uh, model that has helped us uh, get phenomenal numbers in environment and sustainability charts. And in the end, the uh, taking steps by uh, tech. Moving on, particularly what basic challenges we had when I talk about implementing the basic safety was the SIMOPS, given the number of, uh, well, I come from the petroleum engineering background, uh, having uh, worked for almost a year, I've seen we have SIMOPS operation of well services, workovers, along with the daily o &M jobs. So that was a challenge to manage. Again, manpower management, because we have both the operators and the business partners working model. So the contractors are there and we ourselves are there. And the location dynamic, I come from the Rajasthan Barme district where our plant is located. So everything from the temperature to the landscape is a challenge in itself. So to start with, what were the basics that we got right? I think Hazop and Hira, I think everyone in the room knows what that is and how important, how crucial that is to begin our operation. Moving on, before beginning the job, the JSA should be in place. And there's one particular thing that we have to put in picture, the new people coming in, one like myself, the green hats. So the policy is to include people like ourselves into such a hazardous operational area should be there in place. And to you know sum up everything that is here, I think PTW system is the one crucial element that has to be in place to ensure that these technologies and the people are in place where the uh, work is being executed. So I'll just brief on how we are doing that, including the people and the process for the job of execution, how PTW 
forms the envelope of safety. To begin with, we have the permit creation, obviously, depending on what the job is. We move on to the deliberation on the job, including the performing authority. That oftentimes is the business partner. And from our side, the area authority it could be IMs or the PSPMs. Then moving on, we have the site preparation, depending on the job, which includes, again, the performing authority and the uh, PSPM. Then in the part of the process, we deliberately go on to discuss the controls that is there to ensure that safe manner, uh, the work is executed in the safe manner. We verify that with the help of the uh, performing authorities and the area authority. And then the job execution is rendered. And in the end, for the closure of the permit, we ensure that the area is back to the normal with the safety in place. Very quickly moving ahead, two, two cr crucial elements that I'll be sharing here is the confined space monitoring because uh, from the operational area I uh, hail from, we have a cellar pit model, which is basically a six meter depth, six meter wide and a, around about 10 to 12 meter uh, long area in which different number of wells are located. So every time er there is an intervention, the person has to move inside the confined space so for that, this particular thing, the, this piece of paper that is there in the field along with the permit to ensure that the levels of the S2S, one of the crucial hazardous gases that is, that is present in our field is monitor. The person going in and out is ticking the boxes when he's going in, when he's uh, coming out, the uh, time limit being 10 to 15 minutes depending on the outside condition. So this piece of document seemingly very trivial makes it very important to ensure that our manpower engaged in the job is safe. Second thing, lockout and tag out. Now again, the field that I'm talking about, Ashwarya Barmer Hill has HRPs installed. So isolation becomes paramount important uh, whenever the uh, intervention job is being done and one particular eco shot survey that I'll be talking about uh, henceforth. In that case, lockout becomes a very elementary but very important process to execute the job safely. And for that, this piece of document comes handy where we ensure that all the isolations are mentioned, all the locks are put in place and the people working have been designated and demarcated in this piece of paper. Again, with this, what we achieve, all the red dots that are scrambled we achieve identification of the job and the location specific hazards and planning the controls. Clear communication of all functions on the job. Different number of people will be coming into a role to execute a particular job. It could be someone else's job in someone else's territory. So those two parties need to interact clearly what is the intention of the job and how they are going to execute it. And in the end, manpower tracking and control because as I said, BP and operator both will be engaging in the job at the same moment. So we need to know who is doing that and where they are in the job scenario. So with that, we get a greater coordination and a better control in a more precise manner. Moving ahead, I'll be talking about the multi-well single pad approach that I talked. Beginning with the drilling scenario, the one thing that we have been able to achieve is lesser land disruption. That has given us good numbers in terms of the sustainability model. And again, the small snippet that you see, that's a picture of the uh, Ashwarya Barmer Hill, where existing wells were there, but the purple line goes through, denoting the horizontal drilling that has been done in that area without any risk being uh, developed furthermore. So towards the new without hampering the old. Again, moving on the day-to-day -day job, the production that is done with greater efficiency over the control systems and the SIMOPS that I already talked about, uh, the simultaneous operation of interventions and the regular O&M jobs are being done more efficiently. In terms of the digitalization aspect, we have dashboards that from uh, in the control rooms where we can see all the numbers, all the parameters from the well of different, different cell pits and different wells. So that we are able to see. And if there is any uh, scope of optimization, our dedicated team of production optimization helps us do that and plan our intervention jobs. In the end, the chunk that has to be shared in the Paramount is the HES, the sustainability and the safety part. From the very trivial thing of ensuring that in our field we ban zero use plastics, which is a nationwide drive to deployment of EVs 
to ensure that we have lesser numbers of carbon emission and then again zero cold flaring they, uh, these are some things we have been able to do this single well uh, sorry single pad and multi well approach has given us a, a scope to implement a 40% of green belt area which is a good uh, number ahead of the industry requirement around 33% then again uh, this third point 100% ai capturing of the entire area this again is being able uh, to you know 100% capturing is only possible because we have lesser area coverage in terms of the number of wells we need to monitor because we have more wells in a very precise location and then G, uh, gas detection detectors and the flame detector again come in handy because we have 1 is to 3 ratio with each one gd and fd we are able to look at three wells simultaneously because we have that cell up at model in place now i'll just take up the next one tech in each step in this i'll be talking about particularly the ai camera uh, surveillance apart from that the paper goes on to mention the double barrier that we have in place because obviously when we are going into the uh, uh, unknown we need to have double checks in all our uh, operations and this particularly i think ravi chandak himself uh, had a, a detailed paper about automated fluid level analyzer which helps us know what is the particular fluid level in a reservoir at the moment without you know uh, uh, without thinking of the gas depositions uh, this is actually a cutting edge technology then double polished rod bop ramps whenever we are having interventions with the hrp we need to ensure that this particular thing is in place so that if there is any untoward scenario happening we are able to control that with the two layer of protection now as i said i'll be talking about the ai safety monitoring and surveillance so this again i think tarun sir obviously spoke about this uh, at a length this the particular one on the left is the dashboard the particular dashboard which we on a daily basis interact with you can see the uh, one of the unsafe acts particularly visible there and then this obviously functions 24/7 and we get a analytics dashboard that is there in the bottom from which we can uh, go ahead and communicate so this makes our job pretty much easy what it does it takes data on basis of location risk level and risk category we have that in the tool itself our job comes in the second part where the tool gives us the analysis based on the spatial distribution where exactly in our field these unsafe acts or the unsafe observation are happening and what are the risk distribution what kind of risk people are getting exposed to or people themselves are committing and our job comes at the end for communication and continuous improvement what uh, i think shivin sir also said and tarun sir said that for continuous improvement you need to interact with the people who are being captured in the ai tool so that we take in our hands and we make sure that uh, be it through campaigns through awareness sessions we show them the footages and ask them to not repeat the same in the end i'll show you couple of pictures how minuscule Uh, unsafe acts are captured if anyone can ca see what has happened just now if i say uh, around the bunk there was a person moving without the helmet so that was captured in ai tool so something as trivial as that was being captured and again this happens the um, mail prompt that comes it comes in very quickly about 10 to 15 minutes so we can communicate to the person directly on the field and ask them that you have been captured not so as to bar him or to you know reprimand him but just to show him that this that has gone wrong the second one this is uh, particularly about how it is efficiently capturing in the busy area just take a look and if you can capture in your mind what has gone wrong here you see something moving so the crane was operating the search tank was lifted and a person near the search tank obviously invisible to the naked human eye was captured by the ai tool if you see just by the corner of the uh, yellow crane there is a person very small not visible to us but it was captured by the ai tool that he was in the line of fire in the zone of a uh, crane operation happening so this again was helpful for us to communicate to the team that 
we have to maintain the safe operations and the people need to stay away from the barricaded area. So this is what the tool has helped us achieve. Now again, all of our dignitaries here talked about the future. I think everything we implement, be it from the uh, conventional norms of PTW or the cutting edge technology, we can't beat our chests just like that in the air unless we get some figures right. And over the six years, at least Kane has seen some green areas. We have been able to cut down on the numbers. But again, as everyone said here, the future has potential of intense job. We have to achieve many targets and this needs to continue. So I'll just leave this podium with last message that consistent collaboration and everyone's contribution can achieve the improbable. Everyone in this room need to collaborate with each one of us and we need to share thoughts like this in forums like this. So I'll just thank you everyone for giving me the time. Thanks a lot. Thank you Varun, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, since it's an operational area, there is always a good case studies for implementation of AI plus safety. And we are looking forward uh, in future how AI plus safety will make uh, the change in safety behavior, uh, not only of the human being, but also with respect to the safety inbuilt in the equipments. So I think uh, Tarun and uh, you can collaborate uh, very well uh, in your uh, yeah, I'd like to just of safety. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tarun sir publicly, because that was actually Detect Technologies, the AI tool. So thank you, Tarun sir, obviously. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, now we call upon uh, Anshul Kumar Tiwari, Manager, HMEL. So this is about my company. Uh, I'm from HMEL. I'm representing HMEL. We are in refinery. We are in petrochemical. We are in uh, soda. We are in uh, fine chemicals. And we have a diversified business. Uh, we are running refinery in uh, refinery and petrochemical plant in uh, Bhatinda, Punjab. Uh, we are pumping crude from uh, the Mundra terminal to uh, Bhatinda. Now, this is the model we are following uh, in HMEL. It is a CCPS, basically the model, it is a, a blend of CCPS, RBPS, Displaced Person Safety, then Energy Institute UK model, and finally the, uh, the uh, OSHA PSM model. Right, uh, so uh, basically we started our implementation of PSM uh, 2015, before 2015, and now we are in very good stage. Why I'm saying very good stage, uh, I will uh, go through with this. So this is basically a model. Uh, uh, look, CCPS, the Energy Institute, the OSHA, every every organization, every, every standard guideline is saying that you must monitor your performance of PSM in different aspects. Uh, the API, they have very good uh, the standard, the guideline for monitoring the performance of PSM. Uh, we, are, we, we started following those uh, guidelines uh, until 2020, uh, we, we did that part. But we thought that we, we uh, envisaged that there is something missing in the API standard, the CP, CCP as a standard. And then we put a, one more layer of tire. So basically it is tire 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, type of... Uh, uh, thing it is followed in API, it is given in API. So we put one more tire in the uh, the pyramid and that is tire for the physical substandard condition and the near miss, the human producing condition. The Tarun, uh, Shrivend, uh, Garo, they talked about the human factor, the 80% of incident is, it is because of the human factor. Okay, so how we can capture the human factor and then how we can further analyze those things to improve the process safety management system, to improve the operating discipline, to improve the design aspect of the plant. So basically, I am presenting a case study, a basically success story of HML, where, where we utilize the data, power of data, to identify what is the problem in the system, how we can improve the system. And I will show you a few, a few slides on that. So basically every organization, they are uh, monitoring their performance of PSM uh, with respect to safety indicators or process safety indicators like leading and lagging indicators. Okay, and we, we are also following the same thing. 
so this is not new thing uh, what uh, we are following maybe maybe some organization they 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 have the uh, the proactive indicators like 2 3 4 5 we have we have implemented some 18 type 18 type of different type of indicators now uh, when we are saying every organization they are following this uh, uh, collecting this data they are showing the data they are uh, measuring the performance but whether every organization they they knows that what is the power of data because the left hand side the right hand side everything is data everything is data and every data is saying something something very critical okay so we understand the power of data and we uh, converted our dashboard into predictive model dashboard now it is not about the the leading lagging indicator we are uh, where we are measuring the how many accidents are happening because of loss of containment or how many loss of containment events that is that is happening we are move, moving forward towards the uh, the proactive indicator where we are saying that whether everything it is plays every management system every element performance it is aligned with the company objective or not finally uh, we have moved our target from proactive indicator to predictive indicators and we have developed we have developed a in house capability for uh, predicting the incident using the different uh, indicators like process safety in incident the operator safety round the near miss reporting uh, system the permit compliance uh, the uh, the investigation compliance the sop verification everything now uh, everything i'm um, basically it is not indicator but this is the data okay now data is coming in a system where we are further drilling down that what is the exactly problem in the system like mr manoj said that vulnerability index we are measuring what is the deviation and how much the deviation it is but why this deviation is why how we can use that deviation data in different direction uh, i will show that thing here in this uh, this presentation so we have built a capability in house capability for this uh, particular five different uh, parameters or indicators where we can, we are able to uh, get the data huge data thousands of uh, the uh, data is coming to us we have filtered that data into different categories and identifying what is the exactly problem what uh, where is the problem and how depth the problem is and based on that analysis we are able to identify the uh, the what are the different uh, uh, ways to manage the situation so not going uh, uh, very deep in the uh, theoretical part this is the success success story of uh, hml where we have uh, uh, we are getting numbers of data numbers of data in near form of near miss so uh, to strengthen process safety we uh, we we motivate people to report the incident report the near miss in this categories okay so these are the categories basically it is not uh, not a single line but it is the cause of accident immediate cause of accident we have did a detailed analysis of accident across the globe we identified that what are the different causes because of which accidents are happening especially the process safety incidents are happening and then we have bifurcated this thing now every person every because it is my kpi to report the incident uh, we have given them the resources that what process safety is what process safety near misses are so we are getting a very good data now every person is reporting the near miss uh, near miss in this form okay basically what happened once they reported this thing and we are getting this thing okay so you can see a numbers of process safety near miss data is coming further we are dealing uh, dealing down what is the sources of leakage what material actually it is released from where it is released what type of equipment it is released so you can see that uh, the data mainly mainly uh, you can see last graph where the small bore connection it is a issue and i i am i'm telling this thing the small bore connection it is a issue for all the organization which we, uh, who are in the refinery okay because because it, it is the list uh, list uh, conscious thing and as of date there is no engineering standard for small bore connection work so what should at side hai. okay kahi par bhi laga do kaise bhi laga do that is fine okay but the small bore connection it is a pain it is a pain area for all the organization as of now what we have did is with this analysis with this focused approach we are able to identify the where is the small bore connection is the problem what problem how much depth is this after conducting this detailed analysis we uh, we further drill down that why this problem is so uh, i said that there is no standard we don't have any standard of uh, small bore connection even 
so we have produced we have developed our own standard of data analysis uh, the small bore connections okay second part we identify some area where the operating discipline it is a issue where the well the uh, quality assurance program with respect to uh, small bore connection it is a issue so uh, basically with the help of this data analysis system we have revised our mechanical integrity program we have revised our engineering document we have revised our psi process safety information so basically it is a it is a system it is a data driven process where we can improve our process safety management system as a overall and when we are saying human factor so when we are sitting at the chair when we are coming out coming in it is all human factor so which human factor it is actually causing the problem we need to identify those those area with the human performance the human producing condition and human performance producing condition we can do the further analysis we can identify that humko exactly where we need to focus in the direction okay so we did that also so basically uh, with this analysis uh, there is number of uh, deviation we observed in the small bore connection we further drill down what are the percentage across the organization we did some root cause analysis the performance management analysis we identify that there is issue of design there is issue of management system there is issue of operating discipline and with that analysis actually we improved our design we improved our management system we improved our process safety performance management system and finally we improved our operation discipline so basically the tarun uh, tarun said the data is power the god said data is the power she went to analyze the thing and he said the data is power so hml did the analysis and they shows that yes data is power and if we analyze data in the right direction definitely it will help us and it will help in preventing the process safety event any so this is uh, this is the thing uh, the challenges basically we faced here is uh, the data collection how we are, how good get data basically data data part is uh, part is how how many data you are collecting and second is how good data the quality of data so basically uh, the, that problem we also face uh, for that Uh, we have conducted many campaigns many scenario many many process safety related campaigns we have did with some books we have uh, released also which is basically focusing on what exactly process safety is for you it is if you are working in cdo plant what is the process safety re requirement in your plant if you are in fcc what is the fcc related thing uh, sense of vulnerability uh, we have talked normally of deviation we, uh, we talked about uh, how we can improve the sense of vulnerability if it is sense of vulnerability is improved people they are uh, starting reporting the incident so something we did to improve their uh, the sense of vulnerability like uh, process safety uh, uh, book of each unit each specific location we have prepared the lfis we have attached in that book so that uh, people they can learn that uh, what are those incident happen in cdu plant that specific area so that that makes their sense of vulnerability more improved and uh, because of that they are the, now reporting the data so uh, this is the this is the final slide for me thank you thank you sir hope uh, okay fine thank you uh, thank you anshul uh, from the presentation on process safety management at hmel process safety events are uh, uh monitoring process safety events and uh, mo monitoring the uh, near misses in process safety related near misses is very important uh, in a process industry and, uh, and not uh, it has not become part really today we see that uh, occupational safety related the near misses and uh, unsafe conditions and unsafe acts are monitored but not uh, to the same extent process safety events especially Uh, op uh, systems operating beyond operating envelope and uh, touching alarms these are very important because unless we monitor unsafe conditions and unsafe acts closely we can never uh, have the confidence that uh, you know uh, near miss also is a bit late i feel uh, so you brought the focus on uh, tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 process safety events and how hml is handling them thank you for the presentation thank you for the presentations uh, yesterday i was giving one presentation on uh, people management and uh, uh, i prepared a presentation and in that uh, the uh, report of uh, world economic forum on uh, job of futures 
three key aspects uh, they have identified uh, with respect to next five years. So the, th those three key aspects were creative thinking, analyticals, analytics and AI and big data. So these three key aspects are going to play a significant role in the safety and safety require a huge innovation, especially uh, though we are taking every measures to uh, safeguard our, not only humans, our properties also, but still accidents are happening. So, with uh, based on the today's presentation, I have written a three keywords, analytics, dashboards and AI. And especially with respect to the behavior, it's the learning mindset, especially on the safety aspects and the human behavior, which is going to play a crucial role in defining not only the safety uh, in our day-to-day -day life, but also in the projects, in the operating plants. So with this, I will conclude my remarks. And thank you for the wonderful presentations. And my co-chair, I will thank you also for giving me any... uh, support during the, the, uh, thank you. During the session. Thank you. Thank you.